So I wanted to start with one particular uh, question that bothered me throughout ages, throughout my ages, uh, and that was how, um, how can world look like if you could see any other dimension than what we can see, three spatial dimensions and another feel of time? What if the world had more dimensions than that? What if we lived, for example, and I want now to place everybody's mind into this floor, and you lived in two-dimensional world where you can only move within the floor, within that plane, and somebody suddenly put a chair on your world, uh, providing that nobody's hurt now in your world, your geometers will run immediately and look for those four circles that appeared out of nowhere in their world, and they wouldn't know really what to make of it. There is one, two, three, four. They are in some kind of orientation, but there's no connection between them. What if you could perceive the third dimension up here? You would see that that's a part of an object, and all of these are connected. And somebody made that object with a purpose and with intention put it onto your world. How much of the information you are losing just by not being able to perceive one extra dimension? So that was my big problem, and still is, how can we find a way to overcome those lack of senses? And one of the ways which is brilliant is mathematics. What prevents you to do four dimensions? Nothing really. You can have a line, and that line is one dimensional. You push the line parallel to itself. You have a plane, two dimensions. You have a line, length A, uh, surface area that you push that line uh, parallel to itself would be A times A. You push that plane, that little square that you got, parallel to itself, and you will get a shape, a three-dimensional shape with volume A times A times A. Now your vision is blocked, but you can do easily math of A times A times A times A and go into four dimensions. And that's what we do, enhance our senses every day in every single sense. Our vision is really poor. So if you want to see anything in the universe, you have to magnify it, you have to uh, let's say, see our moon like that magnified, or you travel, which we do these days, uh, with Cassini spacecraft close to Saturn and to see another moon, uh, Saturn's moon uh, Enceladus there. Uh, but that's not a problem with our vision. We can magnify all we want, but we do not see things. We do not see all the light that is out there. We do not see cold radiation from bodies, and that's also called light, that are colder, like uh, minus 270 degrees. Uh, we do not see even our own radiation. If we turned uh, off all the lights, we wouldn't see each other. We don't see that, what we call infrared. What we really see glowing from objects, unless it's just reflection, glowing objects, objects at about 600 degrees start glowing dull red. And as you heat them further, like your stove element, they would go through rainbow of colors all the way until hotter than 10,000, you can't see either anymore, it's ultraviolet. And hotter than that is X-ray and gamma ray. And if you could put a uh, 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 kind of like a boundary here and here in this spectrum of light, and stretch the spectrum of light to be uh, something like width of Canada, human vision is a thickness of a human hair. That's how little we see. So what do we do about that? Well, we have to now enhance our uh, senses again with something like uh, detectors of that light which we can see. You see here solar image, sun, our sun. This is what humans see. All the other colors are false colors of lights which we can see, but your dog and cat can see some of them. Ultraviolet, they can see it. Birds as well and insects. And snakes can see infrared which we cannot see. So these pictures here bothered me the most all my life. This is sun. This is sun in human visible spectrum, this one here, and this one, and this is the dull picture. All the others come from different forms of light which we, our eyes are not sensitive to, so we needed instruments in order to perceive them. This picture here is of me, uh, seen by humans. <laughs> so this is me at Jet Propulsion Lab, seen by human camera. The other one is seen by camera, either military or snakes can see it. This is the distribution of heat on my body. And you need now, because these are all false colors, just like in this case, 
uh, false colors which we cannot perceive need code in order to decode them. So we know that here the brightest uh, white is the hottest thing and uh, if we decode it properly you know distribution of heat on my body here. So now look at the sky. This is a region of sky which is pretty dull aside from a few interesting stars around the hunter but look at this now. This is view that snakes might see because this is infrared. This is that lower temperature than humans can see. Stars are forming there that are lower temperature than when they start glowing in human visible light so that we can see them. So this is the area of a vigorous star formation where stars are protostars, stars in making, and the clouds from which the stars are made. Look at this image here. There's a galaxy called Hercules A. And it's a dormant galaxy. You don't really recognize anything special. It is very non-active galaxy in human view. But if you turn radio telescope, radio waves are emitted by the coldest uh, gas in our universe. You see jets of hydrogen gas <coughs> ejected from the very center of that galaxy. And you see that that galaxy is active. We knew nothing about it until we enhanced our senses with some other type of vision. This light here came from the very origin of our universe. That is radio waves that are all around us at equal temperature, minus 270 degrees, and they were found after the idea of space and time being connected, idea by Einstein, space-time as we call it, the thread of the universe, space-time. The problem with that idea was not only that we never uh, before 1905 knew anything about space and time putting it together. The problem was that space and time in his idea, and it was tested, trust me, so many times over these hundred years, that it is actually malleable by matter. When you put it in space time, space time curves in the presence of matter. And one of the other researchers, not Einstein himself, Einstein didn't believe in that, what I'm telling you right now at all. Uh, Father Georges Lemaitre, he calculated that if you put matter in universes, space time, it is going to be unstable, either contracting or expanding. And he, Einstein, absolutely couldn't believe in that. He stabilized equations immediately. But at the same time, Edwin Hubble, this is 1920s, saw that galaxies are rushing away from each other just like something is spreading them apart. So you have a theoretical, very strong theory of gravity at that time, and you have uh, 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 observations that are showing you the same thing. So whether you as human can understand it or not, you have to go with facts that are right in your face. So humanity faced in 1920s for the first time in history, first of all, changing nature of space-time, wobbling and warping in the presence of mass, and second of all, that universe was not forever here. It is not static, and it started. So then, nuclear physicists ask, how did it start? How can universe start? How are we here? Now we have protons, electrons, neutrons. How do they occur? They occur as energy, just condenses into particles. So we had to have in the beginning very high energy so particles can come to be. Particles immediately bond into atoms. Atoms are hydrogen, helium gases. These are clouds of gas. And then what happens is you have gases that are clumpy. You have denser and you have less dense pieces there. But what is now going through those gases is that initial light from that burst of energy and that light we call cosmic microwave background radiation and that light actually is in radio waves today seen because it was predicted by nuclear physicists in 1940s that if you now spread the universe from that energy apart energy will cool and it's expected to be today at about uh, minus 270 degrees Celsius. That was found. This is a recent picture of it, very recent, where we can, can actually measure to what degree this radiation from all over the sky, that's the coldness of the universe, to what degree is it uniform? To degree of 100,000th of a degree, and on those values, 100,000th of a degree, you see these fluctuations that are uh, uh, colder and hotter regions. And what are they showing you? The density of earliest matter 
that came to be in the universe because light went through denser and through less dense pockets and they actually made imprint in the first light in the universe, which is completely coherent with our picture of large scale today, where we are in one of those uh, clusters, super clusters of galaxies. And you see something very unusual in this picture. All of these are big structures that evolved as universe evolved, but the purplish thing colored, it's some matter that is needed to be there to gravitationally keep this together. And that matter is called dark matter. We have no sense to feel it, absolutely no sense. We feel um, visually, even audio, the first light from the universe, this one. We can even predict that if universe was small and dense and super dense in that era, then particles, what sound wave is, a, uh, is a ripple in particles of medium. Particles had to be rippling with space-time ripples in the beginning, and we did actually record harmonic and two uh, uh, fundamental and two harmonics of it. So we can even translate that big bang, as we call it, into sound. But what is needed here now is dark matter, the matter that is gravitationally there, but we can see it, feel it, nothing. We can just color it and say, ha ha, here's purple. But we don't know what this is at all. They're not particles at all. Uh, sound we use also to probe things, which we, uh, that's another sense of ours. Uh, which is very poor, but we can actually convert into sound waves some things. For example, sun. We don't know what's inside. If anybody shows you a book and says, cut out of the sun, that's what's inside. Ask them immediately why. How do you know? <laughs> How do you know what's inside of the earth either? So those elementary books with cutouts of sun and earth, I'm like, is any one of these kids asking, how do you darn know this? You know. Well, we really have a hard time figuring it out, but if you know that <coughs> there's some kind of um, energy burst from inside, it has to manifest itself as ripples on the surface here. And those ripples are, uh, you can convert them into sound waves and then analyze them. And here's the music of our, um, can it work? No, that's okay. It's like brrr, something would be, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> so now, our vision, not only that it's not enough, but what is really crazy is that it is crooked as well. And uh, the space-time that is now uh, curved, and it's curved in the presence of mass, I will go back to two dimensions. I will bring you back to the floor, because this space-time here that we're talking about is two-dimensional. And what we need is three-dimensional space-time curving in the presence of mass into something higher dimensional, but we can't envision that. So I have a bunch of marbles here, and I will show you how when a mass is in curved space-time travels now, all the orbits are nicely um, uh, you know, set uh, uh, mathematically to be perfect, what orbits of bodies really are in the nature. And look at this mass now that's traveling through space-time. Huh, it curved. And imagine now light doing the same thing, curving like that. So what is here in this picture is a specific thing that I want to point out to you. This is you here on Earth, so that's you over there. Uh, there's a huge cluster of galaxies that is supermassive, making huge indent in space-time. And here's galaxy which you cannot see because of this intervening one here. But the light from this galaxy goes in all directions and few rays are going along the curved space-time and coming to you this way. What you can only see is the last bit of light and the mirage that goes along that last bit of light to you, and you see mirage behind galaxy. You don't see galaxy at all, you see mirages all around this cluster. Look at the real picture in the sky. First people thought, oh, these are some arcs, you know, from faulty optics. No, they are real mirages of things that are behind this cluster right here, and they are lensed because cluster is making huge intended space time and light is going curving and coming into your eyes so that you visually see completely bogus picture. 
something that is not out there, but you can analyze it. The more massive the mass is there, the, the, the uh, big you know, uh, blob is there, the more curving will happen. So on the basis of this curvature here of uh, these images, you can make what is the mass of a cluster. And when you do that, gravitational mass that made this is so much bigger than any luminous matter can show you. Dark matter is right there, staring at you, screaming at you. You can't see it, but gravitationally it shows it's there. In a perfect alignment between a lens and that lens, the galaxy, and you, you would see actually a circle of images around lenses. And these two are, this is real photograph, these are two uh, galaxies that are making a huge indent in space time. And behind you have a blue galaxy, which is smeared in a circle like that. So that's uh, to the best of our ability to interpret crazy things that we see in the universe. So now, how was that tested? That's the first thing you have to ask anybody who's telling you this stuff. It was tested by the longest running experiment in history from 1920s when it was thought of until 2008 when it finally finalized results. Four gyroscopes, which are spinning things, keeping their axes uh, as steady as possible, and a telescope that is pointing to a distant star. They are going in a swirling, uh, space-time, which according to Einstein has to be tagged by the spin of Earth around its axis. And if space-time is tagged like that, we call it the frame dragging, uh, then gyroscopes have to go with the space-time that is curved. And so many years of uh, making it and technology advancement, and finally 2004 and 2008 confirmation came. Gyroscopes moved exactly according to the curvature of space time. Absolutely brilliant thing developed from 1920s until 2008. Now, the consequence of that is that you have space-time curving around masses. Imagine yourself, actually. That's what I imagine every day when somebody wants to spill coffee in the bus at me when the bus abruptly stops. I'm like, oh, we're all wobbling in space-time, making some ripples in jello, uh, because we are. Uh, throw a little bit um, of quantum physics and say we are now waves of energy blobbing through rippling space-time around. The you'll have a funny scene. You will not be annoyed by people that are really annoying you know, around you. <laughs> uh, your neighbor who wants to sue you for 20 centimeters of land, thinking that's who owns that land anyway. So that's a big picture that we have to take from here. This is here, two black holes orbiting one another. And they make a serious ripple in space time. That ripple propagates, and here's another artist uh, imagination, it propagates as a gravitational wave. This is a um, uh, kind of animation of what was received into our LIGO detector in 2015. Two black holes, 1.3 billion light years away. That signal traveled 1.3 billion years to reach us, the gravitational wave that is the result of it, which is the ripple of space-time itself. It, it's not like sound rippling or something jello. It is a space-time itself. How cool is that, that you can actually envision yourself really rippling through space-time? This is the sound of it. Listen now. Whoop. That whoop was actually... Whoop. That was the sound. The, the frequency of that event, of that gravitational wave, was in human uh, audible sound. So it was converted into sound, and you can hear whoop. So that was actually two black holes 1.3 billion years ago colliding and sending signal. And as poor as our senses are, we figured out where we are in a cluster of galaxies, in a galaxy like, like uh, this one here, somewhere right there. And we are in one of those 200 billion stars inside of that galaxy. Third rock from the sun is ours right there. And, uh, our ability to look back is stunning. We actually turned back a, um, a, a Voyager spacecraft and later on turned back in 2013 Cassini spacecraft. The uh, uh, sun was covered by Saturn's disk and what you see here, this is Earth and the moon. 
That's where we are. Where are the boundaries of species, of uh, you know, nations, of colors, of boundaries, of uh, lands? We want to blow up this thing, the only oasis of life that we know? My point tonight is that science is very humbling discipline. You can learn to love others. You can learn to cherish and to appreciate togetherness, fighting all of that misery that is around us, because we are all just over there. And it's a second before we blow it all up. And I don't want to do that. Uh, so yes, thank you very much for coming tonight. <laughs>